Welcome to Real Estate I Love It podcast. I'm Shelly Hoffman, real estate expert and community advisor. Join me and various guests who are expert in what they do, such as home inspectors, mortgage brokers, investors, wholesalers. There are so many aspects to our industry that most people are not aware of, and I'm here to help you learn about them. I'm an educator by trade, and this podcast is to educate you in the world of real estate. Hey, everybody, it's Shelly Hoffman with my favorite people in the real estate industry. We have Dave, Rob, Jason, Steve, and Christy. And uh, today's just kind of like an open discussion. I'm going to throw it out there to see if anybody has questions on um, something. Typically, we pick a topic, but, you know, today we're going to throw it. Uh, anybody want to jump in with something they've been thinking of? Yeah, I've got a question for all of you. Um, I've been noticing recently, and I think maybe because the market being so hot, is that I've noticed a lot of for sale by owners. And I don't know if that's something that... Yeah, because I'm removed from the real estate business, maybe it's just coincidence, but I've noticed a lot of them and and I personally don't like them. I think people should, you know, hire the professionals. And I just want to throw that out there to all of you to see what the pros and cons and if you've noticed the same thing I have. Well, obviously I've noticed a little bit because I look at the MLS um, all the time and for sale by owners sometimes show up on our MLS, sometimes they don't, depending on, um, you know, if they're using a limited brokerage or not. So um, I'm kind of curious about that myself, actually. If it's a limited brokerage, uh, I'm going to go to Christy, because Christy, you're typically the first person that sees the contract when it's a for sale by owner, right? Um, right. How's that come across to you, first off? Is there a difference when it's a, a limited brokerage and just a basic for sale by owner, or is it irrelevant in your world? It is entirely irrelevant. Um, the limited brokerage. So you're talking probably there's 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 a national one that I can't remember. Um, and then there's locally Northern Star. It doesn't make a difference when I see it. Um, it's still purely just the seller. They have to send me everything. They have to do everything. They have to book all of their appointments and all that good stuff. And they have to kind of run the entire point on the entire transaction like an agent would, right? If there are home inspections, appraisals, questions, just issues that come up, whatever the case may be, in addition to taking care of their own piece, right, of getting the abstract survey, all that, and then moving, too. Um, so it doesn't change regardless of whether it's a true, true FISBO and they don't have access to the MLS or if they use one of those other limited brokers that gets them a little more visibility to the rest of the world. Um, it, it is all the same for me. Okay. It's funny enough because I, like I said, I was kind of curious about that. So, um, you know, again, looking at it from our point of view, a uh, for sale by owner listing, the first thing they have to do is they have to vet their buyers, right? So I'm going to throw it out to Jason because obviously a vetted buyer is going to start with somebody like Jen, right? Does a for sale by owner affect you at all, Jason, as far as how you handle the transaction or what happens? Um, yeah, it does. It, it affects... Uh... Um, everyone that's involved and it affects the both the buyer and seller more than they probably realize going into it. You know, like in, in our world, there's specific things that, that have to accompany a purchase contract. Um, and a lot of times I'll see that their things are missing, like property condition disclosures, you know, the seller disclosures, um, lead-based paint disclosures, and things of that nature, just because they, they don't, you know, they're not sure. So we oftentimes have to go back and ask them for, you know, those things. And then they have to go back and forth and figure it out. Um, there, you know, you lose, you know, you lose a lot of mediation um, from folks like yourself, you know, a real estate agent that kind of, you know, acts as a buffer in between the buyer and the seller and the bank and the attorney and, you know, insurance, uh, home inspector, everyone, you know, so we, you know, we'll find a lot of times, let's say an appraisal is completed and then there's repairs. Um, well, there's no mediator to help kind of determine how things are going to happen and who's doing it and how much people are paying. So just it, it just tends to create a lot more work um, all the way around, uh, just because, again, with any type of um, transaction in real estate, there's each person has a vital role in how things play out. And when you remove someone from that, it just 
you know, creates a little bit, a little bit more of a headache all the way around. You'd mentioned an interesting point as far as uh, the bank repairs. Obviously, before it gets to the bank in a normal, stable buyer's market, uh, we have someone like Dave coming in and doing the home inspection. Now, Dave, you don't, you just literally go in and focus on the property, right? So it may not impact you as much, I would think, whether there's agents involved or how does it look at, like from the Yeah, it, it really doesn't affect me all that much, only that um, the ignorance of the seller sometimes makes me uh, tend to have to do your job a little bit in the beginning, uh, explaining what to expect, why I'm there, how I'm going to be. Um, I had one recently where you know it was a well and septic, and they knew nothing about the fact that they had to have those services taken care of, uh, and the order in which they should be done. Like that, the lady had somebody coming to pump the tank, and she knew nothing about uh, a septic dye test. So oh, draining the tank and doing a septic dye test is a moot point. So uh, mm -hmm. I explained to her that she had to have the dye test mm -hmm. done first before the tank was pumped, which she arranged to do. But if, if I wasn't there and saw her when I pulled up. That probably wouldn't have happened. So there's a lot of things that get missed because obviously the experts aren't there guiding these people along the way. And they do ultimately create a domino effect of more work for everybody else involved. And at the end of the day, they probably don't realize and or care that that's the case because they're just trying to save money. But in the long run, I don't know how much money they're really saving when they negate some of these steps because you end up spending more time, more money. And at the end of the day, you're really not that far ahead. So, but from a standpoint of inspection, it's still the same process. I'm still going to do what I do, regardless if agents involved or not. So that's, that's the angle from my end. Well, you know, I was listening to you talk and I thought about something Jason had said and, um, and nobody thinks about it. One of the things I love about my job, I mean, other than the obvious stuff is finding that sweet spot between the buyers and the sellers when it comes to the home inspection, like making sure the buyers are realistic and what they're expecting to have um, repaired, right? Every home you want. I can't imagine, Dave, you've ever had a home inspection where you're like, woohoo, there is nothing. This is a one page report because everything is perfect. Never happened. Right? <laughs> no. And on the seller side, people have lived in their home for 35, 40 years, never had a problem. So why are the buyers nitpicking at their houses sometimes? And that might be where you're talking about with the sellers <clears throat> having to kind of have that conversation and say, yeah, you've always plugged your, um, garage door opener into an electric cord, but technically that's not safe, right? Like yeah. little things like that. that a first yeah, time home the to, they might have the tendency to just be there the whole time too, because no one said, hey, look, it's best for you not to be around when the home inspection's done. So I'm dealing with the seller that's all defensive of their house and they're looking around and asking questions. And sometimes they, they get a little upset. Like, how long are you going to be? Where are you going? What are you doing? And, and you know, I, I only have a, a limited amount of patience for that because I don't deal with it every day. Um, so it, it can get tricky, but, um, again, you, you learn to roll with, uh, a lot of different scenarios, but it is unique to, uh, to this process when it's just them and, and nobody, they're free flying. They really don't know what's going on. Yeah. I would think it would make a difference though, Christy, if, um, if you had, a, let's say you had a relationship with a seller, it wasn't somebody that just called you up and said, Hey, I'm looking for someone to represent me in selling my home. And you have that relationship. So maybe to Dave's point about the septic, I heard you chime in like, oh my goodness. Um, if they have, if they sit down and have a consultation with their attorney, because they're not having a consultation with the real estate agent, you know, maybe that would guide um, them a little bit better in the process, right? But I mean, do you really have time? I, I know you would do it because of who you are as a person, but you know, do you have the time to go through everything like that with somebody? Um, or does anybody even do that, take the time to do that with you? There are a few that have come in and said, we're going to sell our house. We're not there yet, but we're getting ready. So these, and you know, it's kind of probably similar to the conversation you would have when somebody says, Hey, I'm getting ready to sell my house. What do I do? Um, obviously we don't talk price. That's their problem. Um, because we're, that's not what we do for a living. That's what you do and what you're very good at. So, um, but we will go through all the things that they need to do, find your abstract survey. But we, if, unless we really know them and know the property, we wouldn't even get into the idea of a septic and well test, um, generically speaking, because at that point it's kind of pie in the sky. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, you know, they're going to pop it out there. And if they don't get offers that they like, which that's also another point of, I guess, reason, like the agents help bring them down to this world of what we can really get right not 
I saw my neighbor's house down the street and that sold for half a million dollars. Mine should too, even though it's a thousand square feet smaller, nothing's been updated. I don't have a pool. I don't have all of these other things that people want, but it should still sell for the same because we're in the same neighborhood. Not realistic, probably not gonna happen. So, but getting them to realize this in this market, especially is very difficult. Um, we certainly had a few of those just, I mean, even with agents. Um, but yeah, we certainly would try to have that conversation, but most of our preliminary conversations, people acknowledge, you know, they listen, some are very diligent and take notes, but that is few and far between. So by the time they would actually get to list and sell, they've probably forgotten most of that conversation. So we don't see it till after the contract comes. Um, you know, we certainly remind them you have to do your septic and die test, assuming that's a thing, um, which those are always very uh, hairy because to Dave's point, if you do pump it first, obviously, then you can do a die test. It's just not helpful at all. And then you have a buyer potentially if you're on that side that might buy a failing septic tank. I mean, not that it couldn't fail between the test and date of closing, entirely possible, but um, you at least have some comfort that it was working. Um, and that can be really expensive to replace. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, Rob, you had asked the question as far as why people would um, would do a for sale by owner. And Dave kind of hit on the point of it's a lot of times it's to save money, right? Because you have the real estate commissions. Um, I would think that a lot of times people would come into you when they're looking at their future and saying, we're thinking about selling our house or not. Do you find that when people are talking about maybe not using real estate, it's to, because of the, the money? I mean, you are a money guy here in this group. So I'm just kind of curious. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, I, I, I was going to say 95% of, but no, it's a hundred percent. I mean, that's, and, and, and actually that's funny you asked that because I was going to throw that out there to the rest of you is, is what's, you know, am I missing something? What's the main reason? I see it, like you say, from the money side and a hundred percent of the time it's, wow, you know, we can save the commission. So that's a lot of money and people don't really realize everything that's in, entailed into selling it. Cause I, I've noticed a lot of the for sale by owners that I have run into have been our, you know, first time sellers. Hmm. And so maybe they're a little bit unrealistic and um, I don't know. It's just, but yeah, answer your question. I, I've, it, it's strictly money that I've, I don't know what any, anyone else has seen, but. Well, I, I know. And again, I, I obviously sometimes I'm the fir first point of contact and I'll talk to somebody from the buying standpoint, like I'll call them and say, hey, I have a buyer for your property. Can I bring them through? And they are there to Dave's point. They don't leave because mm -hmm. it's their home um, and they stay. And so I wind up having that back and forth conversation. Sometimes they've had a really bad experience and they don't feel like the person who was helping them in the past had really done a lot for them. They felt they could do it themselves. Actually, Steve, even though you are an insurance guy in this, I know you have a background in real estate as well. Um, you know, so you are coming at this from two points, right? From the real estate, from your past, and then insurance. Uh, do you think that's kind of on the mark? Like those are typically the two reasons, bad experience and then the money? Or what do you think? Yeah, I think I think most of the time it's money, um, you know, because the math is easy to do. I think I can sell it for, you know, this number of hundreds of thousands times you know, 6%, 7%, whatever the local, you know, commission level is. And you look at that number and it's a big number, you know, and you go, I'm not paying that. I don't want to. <laughs> so, you know, I could pocket the rest of this, do it myself. Yeah, I'll have some costs. And then you start to rationalize it. You know, okay, maybe it might take a little longer, but the market's great. I can sell this thing myself. Mm -hmm. um, I think what, I mean, from an insurance perspective, it's, it's irrelevant 100%. It doesn't matter one way or the other, how the, the property was um, purchased in terms of, you know, who was involved or who wasn't involved in, in terms, you know, in terms of the transaction. But, you know, outside of that, the things that you see just as a, just take me out of insurance, just, just as a general person in, in the area where, you know, you'll log into a Facebook group or something for the local community. And you can tell the folks who are like, okay, I'm going to do this myself. And it's not that they're doing it wrong or poorly necessarily. But they have to be very creative in how they market this thing. So they have to go out and on their own pitch their house to their neighborhood or their community through these through these um, community pages, let's say. And it's very tricky to be the one selling the house and also the one primarily responsible for marketing the house. You have to be careful about what you say. See, real estate agents are responsible for abiding by 
all of the civic laws that we are all accustomed to and have been for the number of decades. But as an individual seller, you may not realize the things that you can and can't say or you're not supposed to say. So all of a sudden you start throwing stuff online and you just violated about 14 different statutes because you didn't necessarily pen it properly. And you didn't think to, you weren't trying to be like offensive or anything. You just said things that really a real estate agent would never dream of saying um, because ultimately they're held to a different standard. And, and it's not to say that we're not as individuals or people in the community, but you don't just get to fly high like that and say whatever you want just because you're selling your own house. So there are certain pitfalls that people don't even think about necessarily right on the front end. And, and then what gets me a little bit is lots of folks will set off on that path to sell their house where they can save all the money, but then they'll go hire a real estate agent to go buy their next one. So in one sense, it's like, okay, I don't mind there being a commission involved on that side. I just don't want to pay it myself, but I'm happy for someone else to pay it when I go to buy a property. And look, that's the game. That's fine. There's, there's no rule breaking there. That's, it's an available option, um, but it is an interesting sort of setup when you think about it, when the tables are turned, when they, you know, go to, go to pick something up on the, on the other side of it. So, and again, I can ensure that one too. So it doesn't matter again, how it's sold or how it's purchased or how it goes in the transaction. Um, but I do think from my previous experience, having an agent involved typically means, and, and typically, I mean, unless you're sewn into the market that you're going to receive a higher price for your home. The question is, does it, does it, does it exceed or meet whatever the real estate commission was to offset it? Right. So I think, but again, commissions are negotiable. You just have to negotiate. Most agents will negotiate with you to a point, right? So that there is some movement. There's not a ton of movement. You're not going to go from six down to two and expect to write it, but there is a little bit of movement there. And for the value that you're going to get in return from having somebody who knows the market and knows how to market in this market, I think in any market, not just a hot buyer's market, but in a, in a down market too, you need somebody who is present and has had the experience in your area to do it. And I think it, I think it's huge. Um, and I think you come out positive on the other end of it. I, um, to, to address your point of uh, the commissions and being negotiable, I, I took a class one time where it says everything's negotiable. You can walk into a, um, a steward and negotiate a cup of coffee. I personally can't do that. I'm like, here's your dollar, two dollars, whatever it is, right? But everything's negotiable. Um, but to that point, for sale by owners, the, one of the first things that a real estate agent will ask them when we call to show our clients is, are you paying a buyer's commission? And I got to tell you, for people that want to do a for sale by owner, you really might want to consider um, paying a buyer's commission for two reasons. One, for everything that, you know, Christy and Dave and, and Rob and Jason have talked about, you still then get the expertise on the other side of the person saying, if you have a septic and let's say that I'm the buyer's agent, I want to make sure that transaction gets to closing. So if you didn't catch Dave in the parking lot talking about the septic, when I when put in my purchase offer, I'm going to make sure that you know, because if the seller messes that up, that messes up my buyer, right? And I need to make sure that the transaction flows through. Shelly. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Dave. Uh, don't you find that most of the for sale by owners are using the MLS to get their product out to a larger group of people? So they are ultimately having to, to negotiate some form of commission on the other end. How many are just truly FISBO? They put a sign in the yard and an ad on Facebook and hope that buyers come to their house. So, yep. So there's different ways of doing it. To your point, there is limited brokerage, which I probably should have explained when I asked Christy the question. And that is you play a, pay a fat, flat fee to someone and they put that, um, that listing on the market for you. And you get the MLS advertising. You're still responsible for your pictures and collecting everything and getting to the attorney. And the way the MLS works is it offers cooperation and compensation. So they have to give a compensation. They have to pay a buyer's agent if they're going to use the MLS. But if it is the, you know, the go to Home Depot, get a sign, stick it in your yard type of a marketing, then uh, or they put it on Zillow, which I think Zillow should have. Um, you know, they have the for sale by owner. They don't put what the commission is. You know, maybe that would change because we never we, we don't put in public. Um, so it's any time, you know, but technically Zillow is a broker and they're asking for cooperation and compensation. So I'm wondering if down the line, 
um, Zillow will put that out there. But as of right now, we have to call and say, are you offering any type of compensation for a buyer's agent? Yeah, and what is it? Because if you're <laughs> the seller's like, yeah, I've got one and a half percent and you can show a house that pays three. Why would you take them there? You're, you're going to limit the amount of uh, traffic based on what that compensation is as a intelligent agent that's going to use their time wisely is not going to push 1% commissions to show those houses. So it, it's well, all relative. It is. And there, there's two schools of thoughts on that because a lot of times business comes from referrals. So if you're working and somebody really wants that house and you have that relationship, yes, yes. you know, you're going to show it and you get the referrals. Um, but I can speak from personal experiences where, um, you know, this was another state had nothing to do with our area. And my um, my friend was trying the limited brokerage and she had an agent and the agent said, my person's between two houses. Everything's negotiated. You're offering X percent. This person's offering Y percent. You know, do you want to come up? So to Steve's point, everything is negotiable in real estate in life or whatever. But but a lot of times it comes down to money, but it's it's what what are you getting? And if you are negotiating commissions, um, the the real estate agent might say, well, you can negotiate it, but now I became a limited broker. You're losing all of the expertise I have because you're not paying for my full expertise. And all those things are conversations that you can you can kind of have. I personally think people pay for my personality. Like who would not want to work Absolutely. <laughs> like an extra? <laughs> I heard people card, on their closing dates just for that one reason alone, right? Like, oh, I get an extra three weeks out of this. this mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that's right. That's you know? right. But there, you know, there is one other element to it. You know, if you're staying local, you know, if you're going to sell and you're going to stay moderately local, and local by definition in this example is local to whatever your real estate agent's definition is of local. So if you if you want to hire someone to list the house potentially at a reduced commission, but agree to use them to buy your next property where they're going to then obviously get paid a commission to represent you. Okay. There, then you, then you have a little bit more negotiating power in that. And most, most of the time, the other person's going to be willing to work something out with you. So you, you know, but I mean, again, if you're going to leave the, the general area that that's not going to necessarily line up, but, um, and Shelly, there's referral fees and stuff like that, of course, but, um, it, again, everything can be, everything can get a little creative and, and there's a way, there's a way to, to, I think, get a little bit back if you're really that concerned about the 6% or whatever it might be. Um, but you don't, you don't necessarily have to do it all yourself to, you know, and I'll say, like you said about brokering with a buyer, um, you're brokering with a buyer's agent. So you're becoming the de facto real estate agent with, you know, with the, with the buyer's agents. You're not really working with the buyer anymore. You're working with the buyer's professional. And now you're sort of now the professional. Um, and I don't, I mean, you could go toe to toe, but I, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's some element to somebody else who does it every day all the time versus you who never does it. And now you're trying to maximize your profit and you're the whole the whole person in charge um again challenging not impossible but you just got to know what you're walking into you know what's funny and um usually i don't share too many stories on when we're facebook live but i actually have a client so we're under contract he's my buyer it's a listed with so there's no for sale by owner anywhere in this transaction but my buyer is such a control freak that I texted him last night and I said, if you don't start letting me do my job, I feel like I should even get the commission because he wants to contact every single person because he's that much of a control freak. But here's somebody who is a control freak and still understands that the conversations he's having with the real estate agent, the mediation between, in this case, it would be the underwriter. Um, right, Jason, which I can't even believe he got to the underwriter because that's just to me, that's a miracle in itself um, that he was actually able to to have that conversation. Because sometimes I'd like to get to the underwriter. Um, I always think the underwriter is like the Wizard of Oz, the man behind the curtain that I can never, <laughs> that I can never talk to. <laughs> Yeah, but, the, 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 trust me. Most of the time, it's not. You don't. You'll you'll say something wrong that will jeopardize the uh, transaction. <laughs> yeah, and so that's kind of you know, and that's kind of where we are. So again, he has rep representation, and I'm like, it's the it's the buffer, it's the mediation. I think Christy and Jason, you know, you mentioned it. Sometimes sometimes it seems silly, but it's I'm real estate agents are not emotionally attached to either side. We care about the person, we care about the client. Um, we just want to make sure that they're getting that best deal. So 
there's a whole conversation out there when you first talk to a real estate professional about agency and who we're working for and who gets our fiduciary duties, which I could bore everybody to tears with because I teach it. But um, but you really want someone in your corner and you do have the attorney. I'm not going to downplay. Um, but there are attorneys out there that will tell you, I don't negotiate. So when it comes to the home inspection repairs, when it comes to the bank repairs that Jason mentioned, if they're not going to negotiate, then it really comes to a buyer and a seller trying to both get the best deal for each other. And a lot of times those deals end up falling apart because emotions come into play. Right, guys? Yeah, well, that's I, a great point. I think you hit the nail right in the head with the emotion part of it. You know, it's just... I explain to people that that are contemplating this is this is the largest transaction of your life. OK, maybe your next house will be bigger. But and and everyone makes these financial decisions based on emotion. You know, that that's basically my business is, you know, taking the emotion out of clients investments. So, you know, and, and Christy had a great point earlier when she's going over the, you know, the, the well, my house is, you know, worth more than my neighbors, but it's smaller and all this. And, and I've seen that so many times. It's people, you know, when I ask them, well, what are you going to listen for? Well, a house down the street went for 350 so I'm going to list mine for 400 because ours is nicer. Well, you don't know that. I mean, that's strictly based on emotion. You know, so you're going to list it for more. You know, people are going to see that and it's going to take you a lot longer. So, you know, hire the professional who takes the emotion out of it. Yeah, my house we all has, make stupid decisions when we base yeah. it on emotion. My house has two thousand dollar granite countertops, so I'm going to charge twenty eight hundred dollars more in the list price. And you're like, wait, no, it doesn't work that. <laughs> or, or someone just put in. Well, I just put in ten thousand dollars worth of a, a worth right. of upgrade, so I have to increase the price by ten thousand. No, it doesn't right. work that way. It's no, not a dollar no. for dollar value. No, those on or, HGTV or swimming pool, for that matter. Somebody puts in a forty thousand dollars swimming pool package, and did, and without even realizing it, shut off forty percent of the market. Who goes? I don't want anything to do with a pool. I don't care yep. if it's a hundred thousand dollars and you get twenty off the price. I don't want the pool. You know, and, and, you know, earlier, Dave, when you mentioned about the, you know, of for sale, you know, by owners. Or maybe Christy did, you know, getting a sign at Home Depot. And I've had so many people. I said, so how are we going to market it? Well, I'm going to do social media. Well, they don't have a Facebook page, so they have to find someone to help them with that. They don't have LinkedIn. So it's just, you know, you, you limit. You, I mean, you, you definitely do limit. There are, um, you know, to Dave's point and Christie's, and I don't, I don't want to act like I don't know all the ins and outs, and I'll talk to people about anything, but you definitely, you have the limited brokerage. You have the access to the MLS, and I I personally think the MLS is huge. Having mm -hmm. access to that, having the emails automatically go out um, to people. And like I said, the MLS, the whole purpose of it is cooperation amongst all the brokerages in the area, but also compensation. So they do. And then to Dave's point, the real estate professional then knows what the compensation is because it's listed right there, you know, for us to see, which is the point of the MLS. Um, again, to get the, to get the house out there. And the, the um, cooperation means everybody's aware of all the houses that are on sale. So brokerage XYZ has a listing they put on the MLS brokerage um, ABC has a listing they put on the MLS. All buyers, no matter who they're working with now realize that house is on the market. Um, and you're going to get all that exposure. The home Depot sign is going to be trickling here, trickling here, trickling here. Yeah. You're going to get exposure eventually, but it's not going to be that impact that right. the MLS has. Um, and that's what I think it is. I mean, there's there's real estate professionals that have a strategy to how a house gets the MLS with open houses mm -hmm. and different things and, you know, and, and having that conversation. <clears throat> Again, you can have it with the attorney like Christy, but when you're talking to a real estate professional, they know how to market, they know how to price. It's the full, it's the full package. So I, I, but again, I'm biased because it's what I do for a living, but, but I definitely think there's a benefit to having the person that's the full package and takes the emotion out, like Rob said. So yeah. And Shelly, don't you think in, in Shelly, don't you think in this market is like, especially when the, with the, you know, sort of oncoming that we've seen of escalation clauses and the more people that you have coming through increases the opportunity in this market for a higher price than what you're listing it for, but you need more people coming through. So three people bidding against each other versus 13, totally different outcome, which could exceed 
more than you were even asking for, which in a sense could pay for some, if not all, depending on the price point of the commission. Uh -huh. So there's different factors in this market, wouldn't you say? So now, the do you guys, you know, Dave, Christy, Steve, and Jason, do you guys see a difference in the clientele when they reach you? You know, the difference between the for sale by owner versus someone who's working with a realtor? I'll let Jason pick that up. I, I don't see anything because if somebody's selling their house, I'm it, I'm not insured. I don't talk to them at, anymore. Right. I'm okay. To buying it. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think it just boils down to, you know, well, first off, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and everybody out there, you know, the, the old adage, you get what you pay for. You know, obviously, every all of us are consumers and we want – to save a buck and not overpay, but okay, I'm going to manage my own portfolio and I'm going to bypass a financial planner. Well, I'm saving money right now, but in the long run, am I going to be better off? Am I going to be balanced the right way? So when the market turns down, if I take a 25% hit instead of a 15, did I win? No, um, I'm going to go buy a house and I'm going to use my buddy who's a, you know, a contractor or knows house as well, and I'm going to bypass a home inspection and buy a Mr. Pack of beer and a hamburger. Okay, I saved a few bucks, but at the end of the day, he's not going to be as thorough as, say, a home inspector. Um, I'm gonna, I can actually go to legal Zoom or whatever the hell it is. I can, I can write my own contract to buy a house. Um, and at the end of the day, something's probably going to be overlooked because I don't do that for a living. Same as insurance. I can go online and click a button and get insurance to and, and talk to somebody who doesn't know me and who doesn't have my best interest at heart. And then all of a sudden, when we, we get a bunch of rain and it, and it floods my basement and I don't have uh, some pump insurance, well, I save you know, $50 a year and now it costs me $10,000. Same thing in the mortgage world. I had I talked to a girl Friday who um, her agent asked her to talk to me. She's dealing with an out of town bank, and there was a, there was a difference in costs of probably about five thousand dollars that they were under uh, quoting, and it had to do with property taxes because they didn't understand how things worked here. And she was really specific on I need to use this amount of money, and and at the closing, this is what I want it to be. Well. She would have got all the way to the end, and then there would have been a, uh, a huge $5,000 surprise. So, you know, again, same with real estate. You you get what you pay for. You know, you have somebody that can help mediate, negotiate, do those things. And, you know, you, you may think that you're saving. Up. And I, and I do a lot of for sale by owners, and you know, they're successful, but you, you, just don't, you just don't know in between all the players – you know, if there's some some piece of the puzzle um, that you skipped, that's going to cost you dearly, and that's why I think having a team of people that the the each knows their industry and each refers out because they know that each person is is going to guide the client the proper way, and at the end of the day, they're going to get you know optimal uh, uh, value with all those services versus them trying to just wing it on their own. So I just came up with a new HGTV show, guys. I think that there should be a house. They sell it first with everything online. Uh, stick in the yard for sale by owner. And then they have their client contractor go through the house for the home inspection. They do the Zoom um, legal. They do the online insurance. They do the online lending. And then they resell the house using a team of professionals and see what that cost difference actually is. <laughs> would be you know could you imagine that'd be interesting yeah, um, be yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there'd be a lot of things um i mean j just for the record i people that do fizbos some are successful people said it on this call some are but i mean they always close but it's a an even bumpier transaction than traditional ones right where there are agents on both sides and the biggest thing for me um, that were the value add for just, just me, literally as the attorney representing somebody in that transaction is the mediation piece for the agent. Like, I don't care how much money they get to be quite frank. 
you get what you get. You get what you want, what you're hoping for. You have your bottom number. The buyers have their number that they can come out of pocket. All that is not what I do. But what we end up doing is having to deal with all of the, the little pieces in between the, oh, well, maybe I want this left or I don't want that or I want this repaired and or I don't want that repaired or the bank said they need these things um, and all of that stuff. And especially as we're teeing up the closing date, which has become a very, 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 very tense time for people. The ability for the agents to for because the attorneys, some of us will just say, no, not going to do that, which is not helpful, right? At the end of the day. And sometimes we even have clients who are like, no, I'm not going to do that. So the attorneys go, well, my client said no. Oh, okay. But having the agents there as a next level to be like, all right, look, before, and I do this a lot. Sometimes I'm like, before I even bring this to the attorney's attention, it's not going to be worth it. All we're going to do is yell at each other and say no and stomp our feet, even though <laughs> we would ask for the same thing that I was asking for if they were me. But the agents can talk to each other as professionals and probably make more headway than the attorneys can. And even with our clients in a lot of ways too, they can say, hey, look, this is where we are because they are again, the first point of contact. They trust them. Not that they don't necessarily trust me, but they don't know me as well. Like it's, it's, it's less of a relationship. It's a little more um, transactional in a, lot of, in a lot of ways, especially the people who are peer referrals in. Um, you know, they, they just know us because they trust Shelly or whomever to say, okay, well, you like them, fine. I'll use them, that sounds great. Um, but it's really that piece that helps everybody feel good about this transaction. And really that's my, one of my big hesitations is that you have buyers who are buying a house, they're emotionally invested. This is going to be their home where they're going to maybe raise a family or just live there for the next 20 years. But you, they want good vibes walking into that place. And a lot of sellers want to sell their house to somebody that they actually like. Right, where they're going to have make their good memories and do all of those things that they did over the past 20 years. So when we get into their fighting over who's gonna fix the ungrounded outlet somewhere or that peeling paint or install the rail or some silly thing that probably should be fixed, but at the same time is really not that big of a deal at the end of the day when we're talking about a house transaction, that's where it falls off and everybody ends up upset and mad and oh, they're jerks and I don't like them. And that's not how at least I want transactions to end because it's just not good for anybody. You know, you raised a good point, Christy, because I always say that as soon as a trust is broken in a transaction, that's when it just starts to be butting up heads. And I talk to my clients about that, whether it's a buyer or a seller. And I know a lot of the other real estate professionals I talk to, we feel the same way. And it's the end. It's the last like 15 days of a transaction where the sellers feel the buyers are dragging their feet. Or the buyers feel like the sellers aren't trying to get out. And and it's only because the anticipation to, to be done, right? Like I always equate it to the teachers and the kids the last month of school. Like they just want that final day of school to be there. And that's how people start to feel about the closing date. Uh, so we do, I talk probably, there's this law, I always say, well, you might not hear from me for a while. By all means, I'll reach out and say hi or reach out to me if you have questions. But those last like 15 days, I'm almost talking to the client every day again because they're like, have you heard anything? what's going on, you know, and they start to build that um, mistrust. And it's easier for someone to get a hold of me necessarily than the attorney because of what you have going on in your daily um, life with all the stacks and everything. Uh, Jason, I, um, I think you can equate to this, like, I'm, I'm bad when I'm a client, right? I probably drive you bonkers the last 15 days saying, when am I going to be clear to close? When is this going to happen? Um, so having, having that, like, sometimes I think that uh, Jay would wish I had my own real estate agent to navigate the transaction because I call him for my own self more than I would call him for an agent because I'm emotionally involved in that transaction. Does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. we just have to, to build that up a little bit. So, you know, I, it's, it's almost Shelly that you're, it's almost a thankless job or, or they take it for granted. And I had, I had a couple of clients a while ago. This was not recently, was a couple of years ago, I had a client who was looking to retire and they were going to move South. So, they said, we're going to list the house by owner. And I said, well, why would you want to do that? Don't you just want to sell it, get out of town, move on with your retirement? And they said, well, our last experience was awful. The realtor just, it just went on and on and this or that. And it was a nightmare. And so then I asked them, I said, well, what happened? And they explained it and it was all, 
you know, a buyer's issue or it was nothing to do with the realtor. And I just said, well, think about this. I said, I'm not going to talk you into either way, but just think about this when you leave my office is what would that transaction have been like if you didn't have that agent? Two weeks later, they called me and said, we're going to list it because we can't imagine going through that on our own. About a month after that, the reverse happened, talking to clients and they said, you know, we're moving, we're going to list it ourselves. And I said, why? And they said, well, the last transaction we had, we had an agent and the thing went 60 days. It was all done and nothing happened. The agent didn't do anything, found a buyer. We sold it and it was so smooth. We can do that. And I said, you know, once again, like the other client, I said, go away and think it over and just think of why it went so smoothly. You know, so the, once again, two weeks later, they called up and said, yeah, it was strictly because of the agent. We couldn't have done all of that, but we're going to list it. I think I'm going to start taking Rob on my listing appointment. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's, 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 it's all of you, you know, it's all, it's the same thing. You know, if, if you, if you do your job and it goes smoothly, the clients are going to say, I don't need them. I can do it myself. You know? Yeah. That's yeah, unfortunate too, because one of the things that has been brought up here is that, well, the last experience was bad. And uh, in any industry, there's good and bad, you know, there's probably more bad than good ultimately exactly down. Yes. so you're bound to have a bad experience and uh it, it's not like you say well i went to a restaurant and you know i had a terrible meal so i'm never going to a restaurant again i'll just cook my own food i don't <laughs> know how to cook it, it, you have to you have to realize that you need to find the right team and rely on professionals that are good at what they do uh to have the cleanest smoothest experience and realize its value um so it, that's really what all this boils down to i think yeah, I mean, and, and I think something that we never even touched on, and and to me, I think is a big point is, what's your what's your time worth? Right. Yeah. You know, do you want do you want to be doing all of it? Do you want to, you know, find the potential buyers and show the house and keep it constantly cleaned and get the call at eight at night? Oh, I want to come look at your house. Can I? And you know, it takes time. For me, my time is more valuable. So, you know, I, I don't want to be doing that. I want some professional. It's, you know, it's the reason why I don't work on my car and I don't change the oil. I think it's right. somewhere else. Right. Couldn't right. agree more. So Absolutely. I had two things. One is for the smoothness, kind of the, 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 the second hypothetical or well, not even hypothetical that Rob had. Um, it's, there and not to to Shelley's or even my horn, but there is so much that happens in a transaction that nobody sees, and there's a reason nobody sees it. It's because we don't want to upset anybody. I don't need to raise issues that we can fix, right, internally between the attorneys or between the agents, because this transaction is supposed to be smooth for the buyers and the sellers. They don't need to know all of that stuff that happens. It's not necessary. And I mean, the number of times that there are angsty emails back and forth or something like that, and I call an agent and say, hey, I need you to step in and talk to the other agent and have them talk to the attorney so we can make this transaction go much smoother for everybody here, because that's the way this is going to get done. That happens so often and so frequently that people don't know it. So yes, it appears that this is super easy. You know, even a caveman could do a kind of thing. But totally not the case. And maybe you will end up in a transaction where it does. And God bless you if you do, because that's fantastic. I will say almost every transaction I have, there is some level of hair on it, whether mm -hmm. it's, you know, peach fuzz or Bigfoot is depends on the day and who we have and the parties involved. But anyway, any which way though, there's stress into Rob's point of, do we really want to be letting every person in? Um, every, and making all those appointments and getting all those phone calls, like you probably have a day job. <laughs> so do you, do you want to schedule that? But, and that brought up a question, Shelly, do you know if they use a limited brokerage, if they could access to like Showtime and all that stuff, or is that wholly no. separate? They do not. It, they do not. It's fully separate. So they, they, because, they get all those calls. Like yes. so if you have a house in like a really desired area, they're going to get 40 phone calls on the day that it goes up. Yes. Can I look at your house? Can I look at your house? Oh, no, thanks. No. Mm -mm. I, I'm glad you brought that up, Christy, because that's, on these two instances, that's what I brought up to these clients. I said, you know, what what you see is probably the tip of the iceberg. You you don't see what's going on behind the scenes. 
you know, the phone calls to get the documents, the phone calls, the letters written. I said, yeah. you know, they're working day in and day out to get the closing. You know, and for all your jobs, it's the same way is clients don't see what we do behind the scenes. Right. I mean, to Christy's point about the showing time, which is a, a system that we have that does like a text messaging or an email, the, the limited broker has access to it, Christy, but because they're literally limiting the amount of work that they do, uh, I have yet to see where one has set up the showing time for the client. Um, Interesting. So they have the ability to do it, but they, <laughs> I've never seen, I've always had to call or text the, the person um, myself. Mm -hmm. So. And, and probably because as a listing agent, when I do, let's say that Steve, I'm, I'm helping you sell your home. And I say, okay, Steve, when someone sets up an appointment, they're going to text me and they're going to text you. You can confirm the appointment if it's a good time for you. I also get that text message. So a limited broker probably doesn't want to be bothered with how many times the house right. is getting shown because they, they already got paid. When you do limited broker, you pay up front. So they take their money and the rest of it is on you. Right. So... That's typically how that works. So limited broker, they get paid whether they actually sell your house or not. So you may be paying for a service that does not get you a closing when you use a limited broker, which I don't think people often think that through. They automatically assume that their house is going to sell. So what's the big deal if they, you know, if they put the money out there, but there's no guarantee and they're not doing anything except marketing your house for you on the MLS when you pay them. So. Uh, any other thoughts? Uh, Rob, what a great, uh, good question. I mean, obviously, yeah. there's a lot of information out there. We probably didn't even cover it. We could talk for another hour, or at least I can, because everybody knows I like to talk. But any any other uh, key things out there that anybody wants to mention about a FISBO before we part ways today? No, I, I know I learned a lot, so... Well, I, um, I I definitely, I mean, I definitely did. I've seen it from where there's agents on both sides. I've seen where I've been the only agent in a transaction. And then I, I've seen things fall apart um, because I've had a, you know, a buyer that I was aware of was looking. They went and looked at a for sale by owner. And to Christy's point, sometimes they make it to closing. And sometimes I get a call in two weeks saying that person was ridiculous to work with, blah, blah, blah. And in my, you know, I say, well, if you'd have had a mediator in between, even if it was just the attorneys, you know, that you were talking to, maybe you could have came to an agreement. But, um, but I don't know if anybody has for sale by owner questions, you got, you got some professionals here that can give you some guidance on it. And, um, and I never, you got to do what's best for you. And there are financial situations and again, not to go down the rabbit hole of divorce or anything bad, but, but sometimes there's a certain number that you have to hit when you sell your house and your house is only worth what it's worth. So I do understand there's a reason for it. And I just want to just close with one thing is I just want to, you know, just Dave hit the nail right on the head when he said there's good and bad in every profession, you know, so just take your time, do your due diligence, get the referrals for any professional you use from friends, family, and talk to people, you know, don't go alone. You really don't need to. No, I think that's a perfect way to end today, Rob. So uh, everybody enjoy your Monday and um, talk to everybody soon. Bye. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye. That's it for this week's episode of Real Estate I Love It. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review on whatever stream platform you're using for your podcast. See you next time.